Hello and welcome to this PowerPoint AC 4.1 and in AC 4.1 we have to assess how criminological theories have informed policy development. So in other words, how has the thinking behind criminology, criminological theories made changes to the law, changed the way we do things in society? Now previously um, I'd done quite a short PowerPoint on this, but what I've noticed is that uh, in the exam this is becoming an increasingly big marked question and what tends to happen is they lump this into different theories so you'll get a question that says something like how do biological theories inform policy or how do individualistic theories inform policy or how do sociological theories inform policy so what I've done is I've split this AC up into three distinct parts so we're going to look at how, um, how biological theories inform policy, lots of different ways, how individualistic theories do it, and then how sociological theories do it. And there are three separate PowerPoints for each of these. But we're going to start by looking at biological theories. So I've just picked some policies that are used in the world today that have their roots in biological theories. And you can probably work out as we go through which theories they are. So this is the shortest of the PowerPoints because uh, there's not masses on biological theories, but let's go through it and uh, see how we do. Right, so the first policy you can look at is that of eugenics. So that's linked to genetic theories. We've looked at Jacobs XYY, we've looked at twin and adoption studies, but in general, this is influenced by this idea of genetics and uh, the fact that um, crime is in some way, or the tendency to commit crime is in some way transmitted through our genes. Um, now this idea has been discredited, but in the early 20th century, it was re it really influenced a movement known as eugenics. So you can cite eugenics as a policy that was influenced by biological theory. And at the turn of the century, eugenicists were absolutely obsessed with the fear that in some way the human race was in danger of degenerating because the poor were breeding at a faster rate than the higher classes. And you can perhaps go back to thinking about Lombroso's theory here about how criminals were some uh, subspecies of humans. So as a result, the eugenicists argued that these poor people were passing on inferior genes for low intelligence, insanity, poverty and criminality more quickly than the higher classes were passing on their so-called superior genes. So they argued that the average intelligence and moral quality of the population was being lowered. Now this is rubbish but that's what they argued. Now what did that lead to? Well eugenicists argued that the genetically unfit shouldn't be allowed to breed. So that led to policies such as the compulsory sterilization of defectives such as criminals because they thought that criminality was hereditary and those with also they sterilized not just the criminals but those with mental illnesses or learning difficulties. And they set up pressure groups to campaign for their policies and these policies were introduced in several countries. For example, in 1927, the American Supreme Court ruled that it was legal to compulsory, sorry, compulsorily sterilize the unfit. So that included anyone with learning difficulties. Um, and they said that you can compulsory sterilize them because it's for the protection and health of the state. And they had other eugenics, eugenic policies such as forced abortions, restrictions on the right to, ma uh, to marry. So these policies were brought in in the 1920s within America. And of course, as this was going on, so in Germany, the same sort of thinking was behind the Nazis' ideas about racial purity. And so you get extreme cases of eugenics in the policies of Nazi Germany. And the Nazis strongly favoured such policies as a means of purifying the Aryan master race by eliminating those that they thought were unfit to breed. 
and initially the Nazis start, started by targeting the physically and mentally disabled and they sterilized over 400,000 people against their will and euthanized about 70,000 and you can start to see here this is some Nazi propaganda where you've got the Aryan child on the left and the non-Aryan child on the right seeing the differences and you can see here um, someone measuring someone up it's almost going back to Lombroso's theory and ultimately the eugenic policies uh, brought about by the Nazis were used to justify uh, the elimination of supposedly inferior races such as the Jews, Gypsy Roma travellers of whom you know six million Jews, uh, 1.5 Gypsy Roma, 1.5 million Gypsy Roma all murdered and along with that they, um, they killed deviants as well so homosexuals, lesbians, drug users, alcoholics and homeless all were classed as deviant all were eliminated in this quest for racial purity. So to sum eugenics up, you know, there's nothing positive to say about it. It was used to justify atrocities such as the extermination of the physically and mentally disabled and genocide of supposedly inferior races such as the Jews. And, you know, to, to justify policies such as the compulsory, the compulsory sterilization of people, of forced abortions, restrictions on the right to marry. It's very hard to say how any free democratic society would ever nowadays adopt such a policy. However, it was the case just over 100 years ago, or just under 100 years ago in America and then later on in Nazi Germany. So you can use eugenics as an example of a policy that's been influenced by biological theory. If you looked at my um, PowerPoint on brain injuries, disorders and biochemical theories, then actually there's quite a bit you can use on policy with that one. So again, um, with biological theories linked to this are arguing that physical, um, that criminality is caused by some sort of physical abnormality within the individual. Um, and what you try and do is change that abnormality by um, changing the working of the criminal's brain or body and cure that condition that causes criminality. So the fact that biochemical processes and factors have been linked to criminality have obviously led to some policies that advocate individualised treatment programmes for offenders. So there's your policy, an individualised treatment programme for offenders. So any treatment programmes that reduce offending, such as by um, um, helping people with drugs or diet or surgery are policies that are linked back to biological theory. So if we look at drug treatments, the treatment of drugs, the use of drugs to try and stop criminality, you could look at alcohol abuse. Um, alcohol is linked to all sorts of crimes, uh, but the drug antabuse is used in aversion therapy to treat alcoholism. So it prevents the body from breaking down alcohol. It gives you the, as soon as you take any alcohol whatsoever, it gives you immediate hangover symptoms, even if you consume the smallest amount of uh, alcohol. So that is a drug treatment that's used to battle alcoholism, which in turn can lead to crime. Um, if you are a heroin addict, we know that drug addiction can lead to crime, shoplifting, petty theft, etc. Methadone is used to treat addicts as a, a long-term alternative to heroin. So providing a legally controlled medical substitute, it's helping to reduce crime through giving drugs to uh, criminals. Um, carrying on with drugs offenders, uh, drug treatment, sex offenders, the uh, still besterol is a form of chemical castration that's been used in prison to treat male sex offenders. So it's a female hormone. It suppresses the male hormone testosterone, but it does have side effects such as breast development, feminization and psychiatric disorders. But it is used to treat sex offenders, chemical castration. And also prisoners are managed by giving them drugs such as sedatives and tranquilizers. So Valium, Librium, Largatil have all been used to keep violent or troublesome prisoners calm. So you use a drug to calm them down. 
Diet can also play a part in controlling crime because um, there's definitely uh, some evidence to suggest that diet and things in your diet can lead to antisocial behaviour. So uh, Gesk et al found that supplementing prisoners diets with vitamins, minerals and fatty acids caused a remarkable reduction in antisocial behaviour, uh, up to 37% in the case of violent incidents. Vitamin B3 has been used to treat some forms of schizophrenia, which is often associated with violent behaviour schizophrenia. And dietary changes have been used to control hyperactivity. So the fact that we have started to remove um, artificial colouring from children's diets may lead to reduction in hyperactivity and therefore crime. So if you look at these um, cereals here, it's hard to say how they could possibly be healthy or good for you at that, uh, when they've got that colour in them. So think about the policies to do with additives in food that have changed, which may be linked to biological theories. And then when we come to um, surgery, um, we can look at um, how lobotomies have been used to alter offenders' brains and bodies to some extent with the aim of preventing them from offending. So um, we've, um, we've looked at chemical castration via a drug, but some sex offenders have actually been surgically castrated. Uh, both Denmark and America have used this in the past to change offending behaviour although it would be true to say the results have been mixed. Uh, lobotomies have been used. That's a major operation that involves cutting the connections between the frontal lobe of the brain. Um, and that's been used to treat things such as paranoid schizophrenia, uh, sexually motivated and spontaneously violent criminals. But it does have serious side effects. And it would be true to say that very few lobotomies are now performed nowadays. But here is an example of um, a schizophrenic boy, eight years old, who had, um, well, he had to be caged in the basement because of his violent behaviour, and that is him before his frontal lobotomy, and that's a year after the lobotomy. So that is a pro-lobotomy piece of blurb that I found on the internet, but it does go on. And then, of course, we actually use uh, biological theory to in, um, inform our policy on crowd control, because we use tear gas which is a biological method to control crowds to disperse rioters because it, it works by causing um, the rioter to be distressed. So it makes them vomit, gives them breathing difficulties, disorientates them, but it can cause lung damage and it can cause even death. So finally, uh, just to sum it all up, um, you could say that alcohol and drug addiction treatment has been successful in reducing criminality, no doubt about it. Sedatives and tranquilizers have been successfully used to calm troublesome or violent prisoners. And chem chemical castration has had some effect in successfully reducing the sexual urges of offenders. And tear gas has been used to successfully control crowds or disperse rioters. But, as I've said before, chemical castration can have serious side effects such as breast development, feminization, psychiatric disorders, and indeed tear gas can kill you if you have too much of it. So there you get an idea of how biological theory has informed policies on how we tackle crime and how we deal with offenders. So you can choose any of those if you get a question on biological theory and policy. Hopefully that has helped and I'll see you soon for my next one of these which will be on individualistic theories and how they've influenced policy. Take care, goodbye.